I'm sure you all, or most of you know Francois Berman. He's a professional graduate medical engineer and holds a master's degree in biomedical sciences from um, Stellenbosch University. He's got a long he's a long-standing member of the Southern Africa and the Hyperbaric Medical Association and provides financial, technical and safety advice to all its members. He manages the chamber accreditation function for Sehuma um, and he's also a member of other international hyperbaric societies together with codes and standards committees where he plays a very active role in advancing the technical and safety aspects of diving and underwater medicine and is currently the director of safety services at um, Divers Alert Network America. So, Francois, thank you very much again and welcome. And Francois is going to talk to us about the technical considerations and updates um, in terms of doing a hyperbaric uh, uh, hazard identification and risk assessment in your hyperbaric facility. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Cecilia. Just let me I'm know just with, um... I'm sharing my screen for you. There you go. Okay. So just let me know if everything works, all the technology. <clears throat> We're kind okay. of getting used to this, but uh, there are always tricks involved in all of this. So firstly, I'd like to say hello to all of you because um, obviously we've all worked together over many years. Um, and I've been here in isolation in the U.S. <laughs> for the last uh, five or so years. But fortunately, you've allowed me to keep engaged with Suma, and it is one of my passions because it's really between that and and France, it's kind of launched me into this career that I find myself in at the moment. So I'm going to share with you kind of the progress as to where we've we've um, moved along from early days at the Suma committee meeting in the 90s, where I was asked to to come up with some way of of measuring or determining you know safety in the hyperbaric environment. And as France would know, when we started the Eugene Marie uh, facility, gosh, all those years ago, the question that was what's asked actually of France and then he flipped it on to me as usual <laughs> was you know will this newfangled technology add a dimension of safety to the Eugene Marie Hospital and the safety people were you know quite concerned because they knew very little of what uh, this was all about and from that we developed this risk um, assessment higher as, um, as Cecilia said hazard identification and risk assessment process to then determine whether these facilities, um, as they were kind of developing in South Africa, were, were safe. And, you know, safety is a very relative term and a, and a qualitative term. And what we've tried to do over the years is to add more, you know, quantitative elements to it that one can get a good feeling or at least some form of a, a scoring or magnitude as to where the safety is. And, of course, at the end of the day, nothing is 100% safe. But what we can do is mitigate those high-level issues and then hand it over to the staff, the operational team that will ultimately determine the safety of the facility. So I'm going to share my screen, which hopefully you can all see. Um, Cecilia, please interject if some of the technology lets us down. My mic is sometimes a bit variable here, and then, of course, our connection is not always perfect. So I'm going to rely on you to chip in and tell me if things aren't working. So some of this will be familiar to, to those of you that have um, been through one of our some accreditation surveys and then some of it is really there to answer questions in terms of of safety in the hyperbaric facility as things change and we've advanced with time and that's really what i'm going to show to you in a moment but it's also allowed us to be able to deal with changes you know new techniques new materials new equipment um, in such a way that we don't compromise our um, underlying safety so let me kick off with a mouse click. There we go. So for those of you that, that haven't been through this, and I don't think there's anybody that I'm speaking to today, with maybe one or two exceptions, that doesn't know what risk assessment is, because whether it's in a hyperbaric facility or in your dival, diving medical practice or your general practice, you have to risk assess your patients or whoever you're assessing to determine at the end of the day when it comes to treatment, um, you know, what, what is the benefit, what are the complications, and where does the balance of risk actually sit because you ultimately responsible for the safety of your patients. The definition I've elected to use that has been refined over the years and it, it's a slightly um, it adds a dimension to typical risk assessment models is that you know what is the probability that an exposure to a hazard is going to lead to lead to negative consequences. So first of all we normally identify the hazard and we're never sure whether that hazard translates into something that's real. 
And the way that we quantify that is by determining on a subjective basis what the probability is going to be. So how likely is it we're going to have an accident when there's been an exposure to a hazard? So without an exposure, there's going to be no risk. And then there need to be consequences as, res- as a result of that. If the consequences are irrelevant, then we really don't have a risk. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll recap some of this with a, with a new graphic that I came up with to try to make it a bit more um, instinctive, intuitive as to how to then score the risks. So each and every situation that we find ourselves in, whether, again, it's something technical, something operational, needs to be identified in terms of the hazard, and then we need to assess whether that hazard is actually a risk or it isn't a risk. And from that, we can then, you know, once we know we have a risk, we can determine the magnitude, how important is it, and whether we need to take immediate action or we can address it over time. If, can it actually be mitigated? Some risks we just have to live with. You know, we have to deal with basis of, of awareness and operational um, attention and focus. And then once we've mitigated it, is that mitigation step effective? Again, this generally refers back to operational issues, training, awareness of staff. But sometimes we have failures in the system. And a good example in a hyperbaric environment would be people ending up with contraband in the chamber or in the chamber vicinity, you know, things in their pockets that shouldn't be there. iPhones and and, um, other types of cell phones are a great example. You know, they get locked up. They should be locked up. The staff carry them around, and then the next thing you know, some staff member has left it on the bed, the bed goes into the chamber, and then you hear the phone ringing from inside the chamber. Not not an ideal situation. So just a really two or three slide recap on how this works. So we start off by walking through the facility, through our procedures, identifying our potential hazards. And in our initial Zoom assessment, this is really what we try to help you to, to do, so that we would have addressed probably 80 to 90 percent of of the issues of concern, but they're going to they're going to come up with new staff members, um, you know, new techniques, new things that we're doing. So what we do is we look at the probability, and, and while some of you might think this is too subjective, when you sit down together, and you should never do this alone. You should have your medical doctor leading the process, the medical director, and then have everybody that's involved and that could have an impact on safety. So it really should not be limited to one person. And then going through basic questions like, you know, is it highly unlikely? It's highly unlikely that putting some piece of material into the chamber is going to cause ignition. That, that's not how the whole thing takes place. So if we were looking at clothing, it's very unlikely that an exposure to that is going to lead to some form of a fire. It will happen, but it's not going to be the cause. And we can go there from unlikely to definite if we've got high energy sources in our in our chambers and we have um, flammable vapors in there, it's <laughs> it's just a matter of time before that actually goes off. Then the second assessment we make is how often do we have this exposure to the hazard, and that can be very infrequent, say less than a year, to continuous. And continuous means the person's in the chamber; it's during the operation for that full 90 minutes or four hours and 45 minutes that exposure is going to be a risk, and therefore we have essentially continuous exposure. And again, we score that on a one to five scale. And then the third part that we we shouldn't overestimate, but in some cases like a fire, it's going to be catastrophic. We know that. And we'll go from really, I won't say immaterial damage, but there might be some first aid or something that needs to be repaired, but really it's not going to affect our process, the intrinsic safety of everybody. So that will be a one, and then catastrophic will be a fire, and we'd assess in between. And you can see the descriptors are not difficult to find an intuitive result to that. And then we define our risk as the part of the Venn diagram where all of these things exist in at least some form of, of significant amount. Now, what I do need to tell you, um, and this is especially true when it comes to clothing and bedding, and because these are the questions you folks ask me. You know, I can't find 100% cotton. Can I use this particular material? And then we need to take that and look at it in three different categories of hazard. So can it burn? Will there be some mechanical failure, something that, you know, the equipment is not designed to be under pressure? And then um, some physiological impact, some injury or long-term um, damage to the people inside the chamber, both patients and um, the attendant if it's a multi-place chamber. 
And that scoring system then, so it's, you know, up to five by five by five and a lot of scores in between, give us a relative magnitude between other risks and where that particular one sits. And I have a table where I've kind of laid out these figures. And again, those of you that have been through a facility assessment know how we score these things. And then we focus obviously on the highest levels. So anything above 100. So this is relatively arbitrary, but when you look at the descriptors, you'll see that the way I've scored it is pretty consistent. So anything above 100 is an extreme danger. And if you come across that, if something happens, if you know there's a cell phone in a chamber and you're dealing with some form of um, alcohol swab or something that's flammable, because there's no reason for, for many of the things we do to say no, what it means is we have to take really stringent steps to make sure that we then don't don't have a fire. And I keep coming back to fire only because it's the the perpetual um, reminder that we have that we don't always get things right. So if you figure that out, then we obviously need to stop that activity, that that, um, that treatment immediately. And when you look at what I'm describing, you'll realize you can use this in almost everything. So when you're determining the risks to a diver in a current, the diver's training might not be ideal, the surface vessel is not ideal, exactly the same ways of evaluating the risk um, are there. Level four would generally mean where the responsible person, and I'm always going to come back to the doctor because we are talking about a medical treatment in hyperbaric medicine, and the doctor therefore has the final say. So if the doctor decides that we can live with this for a short period of time, we just need to heighten our awareness and take a couple of other steps, then one could continue, but it's not a situation that you'd want to perpetuate, especially if you're going into a more routine type of treatment uh, system. Then the medium system um, category is where most of the things that we're concerned about would fall. And we would like to address these things certainly within budget and, and you know practical constraints because the outcomes will still be some degree of injury and some equipment damage. They won't be catastrophic or fatal, but we don't want those, those disruptions. So we want to put mitigating steps. Again, could be training, could be some technical thing, just to make sure that we don't end up with, a, with an outcome that is undesirable. And then we move down to the lower levels where ideally with a low level, we would like to, and it should be easy to mitigate that and remove it, or less than 10, which is a very low risk, and all I advise you to do is if you determine that the risk is low, um, I'm trying to think quickly of an example, nothing's coming to mind, that you at least record that you found this, we evaluated our scoring was less than 10, and therefore we decided to live with it. And this all comes back to if you do get into trouble one day when something does go wrong and you need to defend yourself, you can show the process you went through, the decision you came to. And we, none of us is perfect. None of us could foresee, you know, very extreme things happening. But at least there's a beginning of a defense. So this process um, that we, we use is obviously risk assessment is nothing new. And for those of you that have been around a while, know that it's something that we've practiced over the years in various other walks of life, especially in, in commercial diving. But in the operational context of a hyperbaric facility, you perhaps recognize the different versions of the risk assessment guide. We're in the, the sixth edition now because I need to update these as we learn things and as our codes and standards develop and as we have accidents, sometimes I will remove the importance of that particular or downgrade the importance that particular has in other cases, obviously, um, you know, heighten that level because we've seen that what we thought wasn't an issue has actually become an issue. So this is a very live process in terms of the guide that many of you have seen. Um, over the years. And when I say many of you, I mean those of you involved in um, hyperbaric medicine. Okay. So let's now look at the codes and standards. And Cecilia mentioned that I sit on, on many of these um, organizations, sometimes directly as a committee member and sometimes indirectly where I'm asked to give advice say, on the European codes when they're developing some of those. So we have a range of codes, and I'll put these all together for you in a moment that we refer to, whether it's the US-centric ones, whether it's the Eurocentric ones, whether it's based on international, they all ultimately give us a degree of guidance, but they differ. They're not the same, um, they're not addressing the same things. We do evolve these things and we have regular review cycles every three years with the US documents, we revise these, same as the risk assessment, but I revise it every three years as technology changes as we learn things as we go down with time. And you can see with the NFPA, which is 
It's kind of the longest lasting of all of these. All of these. It started in 1968 as a, a tentative standard on its own, and it was then incorporated in the 80s into NFPA 99, which is a um, standard for healthcare facilities or code for health, meaning the hospital, the clinic, wherever we're operating within. And we're currently in the 2024 cycle. So 2021 is out there, and we're now evaluating the 2024. And it's going to be significantly different to what it is now because technology has changed in terms of new things we're introducing, but also in terms of how we can improve the safety that it's designed into the process and doesn't become a concern to you. I'm going to just turn off now, turn off the video. I'm going to remove the video just to improve the bandwidth here. And, of course, we've taught our engineers as <laughs> we improve the codes. We uh, make it easier for the engineer to apply advanced techniques to, to what could go wrong and prevent that from happening. But what I really want to share with you, and this has been a message, France knows this, that we've been purporting from the 90s, and it's now written into the codes. So uh, I will say with some degree of, of satisfaction, we've achieved that success coming from, you know, from the Southern African perspective and now building into these codes where it's saying, no, 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 we're not going to tell you what you need to do. You, this is a risk. You need to address it, but we're going to allow you to come to a solution. There is no prescription. You need to analyze it and come up with what you think is going to be suitable. Um, so we're basing our decisions that we take on risk assessment. I've taken you through the process and want to see it being used more and more and being introduced to the codes because ultimately it's not the designer that can keep that facility safe after it's been installed. It's the user. And most of our codes and standards don't account for the user in the process. Similarly, we have a really excellent publication called PVHO1. It means pressure vessels for human occupancy. Um, this is the design and manufacturing certification standard. It commenced initially with looking at acrylic windows because we had a need for a non-metallic item to be added to um, to a chamber so it doesn't fall under the traditional codes, and that's how PVHO started. But it's now incorporated diving systems, diving chambers, um, medical systems. We are tunneling at the moment, so Phil, you might be interested to know that we are developing a code to incorporate on an international basis the safety of design and manufacture of uh, tunneling caissons that we use in that. And it's continuously developed. I sit on, on many of the subcommittees and on the main committee, and we're very active. And Charlotte might add to you that I'm very active in, in bringing up, you know, really pertinent questions and trying to get this move away from prescription because prescription is based on empirical findings and actually it's based on, I hate to say this, but the ego and the, the kind of degree of importance that previous people have put in rather than it being a intelligent discussion coming up with a, a real result. And PVHO has, has um, kind of advanced from before we were using glass for windows, and we know that's not ideal. So 1977, based on a lot of research data, they published um, PVHO1, and at the moment we're in the 2022 cycle, the 2019 is the current edition. I, I'm very proud of the work that's done because it's advanced tremendously over the years. And it covers submersibles too, so any form of pressure vessel for human occupancy. NFP 99 um, is essentially a operational um, code, and it's a, currently a very interesting debate I'm having with the committee. This is a, a much broader-based committee with operators and users and people from – essentially it's a fire prevention code – um, hammering home that it's the user that plays the key role, whether it's from the initial request to the final operation, the user, you folks, need to be involved in the process. And often you'd buy a standard product, so you'd have to align your needs with what that product can do. But when we make something specific for you, then you have a very important role to play. In the code, we had this term safety director, which is always stuck under my skin because I don't really see the safety person as playing a significant management role. They are the coordinator getting together the doctor, the safety team, and all the operators, tenders, and so on, making a decision that balances what the doctor would like to see in terms of a better outcome versus the operational safety. And so I have succeeded. The, the new code will remove the word safety director. That is if the public agree and replace that with safety coordinator because there's only one director at a facility, and that is the medical director when it comes to safety. There can be a technical director looking purely at technical issues, 
but in safety it should be a committee um, consensus decision. And then lastly, yes, I've stuck my neck up again, so South Africa is <laughs> a South African is sticking his head out. Um, I want to completely revise the electrical and the fire aspect of NFP 99 because they are based on history. And as I dig back in history, which I've been doing, the data for fire deluge is entirely empirical based on non-relevant research done way back in the 60s. And I found the original um, documents, dug them out from various research institu institutions and, show and showing them that essentially we picked a number. And that number varies between one and seven in terms of the amount of water that is required to be deluged. The European system, I'm completely, um, a complete fan of, just so that you know, most of the time um, in the States, they don't want to know what Europe is doing, but it's a, it's a um, non-prescriptive. It basically says to the, to the design and the manufacturer, prove that the fire deluge system will put out a fire rather than give me this amount of water. That's really what it comes down to. And I'm pretty adamant that we change that from prescription to what is actually going to work. For those of you that know, we had a standard here in, um, South, in South Africa. They're in South Africa, but I remain a South African. SANS 10377 used to be SABS 10377. But it's been withdrawn because we've never really revised it, and the international documents really cover what we need. And with 10 or 11 facilities in South Africa, it's really very difficult to get people together to make changes to that. And in most cases, we would then be repeating what is now being introduced into the codes. And then lastly, there's a European norm. It's called PVHO, Pressure Vessels for Human Occupancy. But it's not a design code as such. It's a performance norm. In other words, before you can certify that chamber, you need to be able to prove to the um, authority um, the notification authority, notification inspectors, we might refer to them, um, before you can get the CE marking that you meet these minimum requirements. You need to demonstrate it either in reality or in paper. It's a, it's a great way of actually doing it as far as I'm concerned. So it's really balancing the performance. Does the system perform as it should versus does the system check all the boxes? And we all know that checking boxes doesn't make something safe. It's actually got to do what it's intended to do. And then we come down to who's actually responsible for compliance. Now, it's a multifaceted um, faceted thing. So we have, in the beginning, the user determines what the designer and the manufacturer need to produce. That's the, op the person owning the facility. Once again, if you buy something off the shelf, like a monoplace chamber, this work's been done, and you then need to align yourself with what it's designed to do. If we're building a multiplace chamber, and France and I did this very effectively way back in the mid-90s when we um, built Miss Piggy. Um, I essentially moved aside what my partner had in mind, and France and I sat down and determined what does what is actually needed at the IAM, and we really changed the design and the construction to meet what was needed rather than what was perceived as being needed. Then the, the, the designer takes that information, turns it into a, to a recipe, which the manufacturer then needs to make sure they comply with essentially what the designers put out there and then additional code and regulatory requirements. And then it actually turns over to NFP 99, or if you want to use the risk assessment guide, which we have, it encompasses all of this. And the user then takes over responsibility and clearly one basis or has a premise that the manufacturer has done the correct job. But we very, very rarely, if ever, have a manufacturing flaw unless we are buying from a manufacturer that shouldn't be in the business. And we had a catastrophic failure early this year of a monoplace chamber that came apart. It came apart at the seam and the tube. Designers, we know, those of us on the codes, you never join a tube by taking a plate and rolling it over. It's got to be molded in position. And it was an accident waiting to happen, and it happened and killed the person inside the chamber. So uh, what I want to do now is, you know, you'll hear us talk about these codes and keep referring to them, and for, for you it might be somewhat of a mystery. So let me just show you how all of this fits together. So we have our code for the hyperbaric chamber, which will – need to meet some or other specification. In Europe, it's the pressure equipment regulation and the medical device directive purely focused on the, on the structure of the chamber. In South Africa, we have SANS 347, which is what's called a conformity specification. Oh, interesting. Um, that essentially defines the risk and then requires the, um, 
the, the designer to, to, to categorize that chamber in a certain way, and chambers normally fit into the same list. It's interesting, I can see a blue line on the screen, which is not mine. I'm not quite sure where that comes from and why it shows here. Then we have our codes, and typically in South Africa, we use the ASME, the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, um, the Section 8 code, which is pressure vessels, or we use the European one, which is a relatively new code because essentially in Europe we had all these different codes, French and German and BS British standards, and they've come together, um, although we'll see now with the with Brexit, but they have a European norm for design. The window itself, the acrylic window, whether it's the tube in the monoplace or the windows in the multiplace, those are designed, manufactured, and certified to PVH01. And this essentially provides you with a pressure vessel that's safe to be used um, with people in it. The second level is the system, which means the the chamber together with the compressors, the air conditioning, the medical equipment, electricity that's supplied to the chamber. So it's the, the chamber system itself, and that is partly designed to PVH01 because we've built on that standard, and partly to EN4931, that PVH01 standard. And in South Africa, it's obviously the medical directive that is being used um, is run by the by SAPRA. The, we're still at early stages of that, and it'd be difficult to get a hyperbaric chamber currently through the medical device directive that South Africa has to approve a medical device because it's just so varied, and it's such a low focus item. But ultimately, we're going to need to get ourselves in that directive, or we need to convince that um, that regulation to accept what is used in Europe and in the US. And this system is really defined by NFPA 99, and it covers pretty much everything, the room in which the hyperbaric chamber is installed, then the lighting, external and internal, monitoring communications, pretty much everything else. And that really makes sure that your hyperbaric system, your equipment, is not only safe, but it's going to do what it needs to do, be reliable, and allow us to achieve the function that we intended to, to have. This all then fits into a facility. And here in, in South Africa, we use the SULUM accreditation program, which I think is one of the best around because it looks at the entire um, hyperbaric operation. And we document that in a risk assessment. And other countries have done very, very prescriptively. In the U.S., we have the, um, the UHMS accreditation program. And it's a great program, but it's essentially a checkbox if you go through 100 and 200 and something questions which is way too much to translate into actual risk assessment. It's, they've made those decisions, what are the risks? And my frustration with this is it's, it basically demands that every chamber has certain aspects, even if it's not going to ever use them and actually have that risk. And this level is where we bring our staffing in. So it's the entire management, maintenance, um, operation of the facility, make sure that we have good quality hyperbaric medicine and that the facility in which we're working in, you know, in terms of operation is actually safe. The, the two previous levels don't build in operation. And ultimately, we're part of a healthcare facility. So, you know, there are a range in South Africa of different accreditation programs, and they go to look at the hyperbaric facility, and the part in pink is what we need to convince them that we have things under control. It's very unlikely that they're going to, um, you know, understand what a hyperbaric facility is all about. The Joint Commission in the U.S. has started to build in a lot of hyperbaric-based questions, but even they will refer back to um, or defer to NFP 99. The most exciting part of everything that I've been um, going on about is hyperbaric med equipment because it's a evolving process. Our previous equipment is no longer available. Um, you know, we can't use the, the ventilators and the patient monitors because they are outdated, they, they, you know, they're not being replaced and the technology is, has advanced. Fortunately, certainly in the last 10 or 15 years, the equipment is intrinsically hyperbaric, hyperbaric safe, okay, kind of being inverted commas. But we still go through the same process, but we're seeing that the power consumption is much lower. We are using lithium-ion batteries, but we know how to deal with those in the safety aspect. And, you know, people go on about lithium-ion batteries, but pacemakers have a lithium-ion battery, and have we ever heard of a pacemaker you know, bursting into flame at a person's chest? And the answer is no. So as long as we follow the rules, that it's not the issue. And in fact, in NFP 99, we removed the prohibition for lithium-ion batteries and said that you will do this as you would do anything else. 
Um, the circuitry is being sealed so that it doesn't get damaged by fluids and, and you know, other interference. It's what I call potted. It's encased in some form of a resin. And the LEDs, in other words, the illumination you're using for the backlight instrument has gone from incandescent globes that are heat sources to LED um, illumination. Again, much lower power, much lower heat. And our integrated circuit chips, like the kind of the brain of the operation, has got you know almost no transistors, which again are heat sources. It's all integrated into this little black chip that does gazillion things at the same time. So our hyperbaric products per se are on the decline. We can't buy things that are hyperbaric um, approved. And even in Europe, and Phil would know this, that we've lost some of those devices, um, pumps and so on. They've gone off the market because the market's just too tiny. You know, we we want to try and convince them how important it is because we have a need for them. But the manufacturer is saying there are so many hoops to jump through now that we're no longer prepared to actually go through all the testing for such a small um, outcome. And if you look on the right-hand side, essentially what we do is we do risk assessment and we determine how can we make this stuff safe for operation. And the top is a pretty old chamber, and they're very adventurous. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of things I could show if we had time in there that would make me really, you know, want to change the way they've done it, just in terms of safety. And at the bottom, there's a very, very unstable patient going into a monoplace chamber. That's not in the U.S. That's in Costa Rica, where we have a colleague that runs an excellent facility. And, you know, he's been through all this before, and he knows how to make it safe. So we have these challenges. Sorry? Somebody have a comment. We have these challenges with new devices coming on, and I'm, I'm going to flip through just a couple of slides just to show you what they are. But they range from blood glucose monitors, continuous glucose monitoring, to cochlear implants and new hearing devices, new cardiac devices, and we need to go through this process, and it's a defined process that works. We do in the U.S., and I'm mentioning this in as, as an example because hopefully we can do the same in other countries. We have this bear that hangs over, and every, every medical director, you know, when they come to, they come to me very often for these questions or they come to the UHMS for the questions, and they say, we want this new device, we want you to make it safe, but it needs to be FDA approved. It needs to be approved as a medical device, and that's not possible. It's not going to happen. And I always say, well, why are you asking me the question? If it is, FDA is the Federal uh, Drug Administration and the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. If the manufacturers are taken through the process, there's no ways we can take it through the process. It's an incredibly expensive and tedious process. And in South Africa, the manufacturer of any form of medical equipment has a requirement or someone that they need to comply with, and that's the South African Health uh, Products Regulating Authority, relatively new but a long way before they're going to be prescriptive to what we're doing. And obviously we want to make sure that it's going to work, work safely, work, um, achieve the results that we really want to have. So if it's blood glucose monitoring, we want to be doing the monitoring, we need to make sure that those results are consistent. But ultimately we're going to be using it outside of what it was intended to be used for. So again, blood glucose monitoring wasn't intended for hyperbaric use. In the U.S., they came up with this definition. I won't read it to you, but really what it says is if the doctor determines that it's in the best interest of the patient, if the doctor has done a proper risk assessment and the doctor's prepared to take responsibility, then based on that logical, realistic rationale, essentially what happens is that the device doesn't then need to be reapproved. Now, what is important for me to add to this is that means that device, that clothing, because some of you have asked me those questions, that mattress, is determined as safe for the best interest of the patient, and it doesn't need to go back and be approved for that particular facility, and it's that doctor's decision. And we need to capture that information so that if somebody else buys the facility, they can go back and see on what basis that was done. And our process, I've divided into two, two different models. Um, these have both been published, and, and are in um, certainly the one on the left is in the NFPA. Again, don't, don't read through it, but this is taking a product, a dressing, a piece of clothing, materials, whatever, through a process of asking a bunch of questions. Can we deal with those particular issues? Many cases, it's not an issue, and yet we get stuck with, um, you know, we, can we use this or can't we use this? But going through the process, documenting at the end of the day, we can come up with confidence that we can use it. And this process evolved from this one on the right-hand side. And again, France has seen this before. 
This is how I evaluate equipment for use. It looks complicated. It is relatively complicated. It starts with a needs assessment. Is it really necessary? And progresses through a risk assessment, through risk mitigation, and ultimately coming out with the appetite by that doctor to use. Um, ultimately, because the doctor needs to endorse the thing for use. Document this thing so that when you have somebody else that comes in or you need to explain why you made the decision, you've got some basis to, to, to place it on. So I serve in the UHMS Safety Committee, and we get thrown these questions um, continuously. You know, we've had 22 so far this year. But going back in time, these, these have all been published. So here's the Baxter infusion pump. That was um, The technical aspect of it was assessed in our colleagues in, um, in Australia. Here's another infusion pump, the Alaris, um, in terms of, th of safety um, assessment. And the author to this one um, actually took my risk assessment process. It was on my case all the time about how does he go through this. And they basically risk assessed it. And then they published it in, uh, in the UHM. I was one of the reviewers, and I kept on seeing my, my information. It actually made me smile at times and made me rethink a lot of things. This one, um, Dr. Cott did, this is a, a, essentially the how to house this uh, left ventricular assist device, not so much the device itself. And again, it was published in DHM, and we went through the process. And I had to go back with a bunch of questions that really just needed to be, to be defined properly. The next comes are we getting into blood glucose monitoring. This is one that was done um, last year, it was published last year, but uh, Shea Bliss is the person that actually did all the work um, under Enoch Wang's um, guidance, obviously, and that she presented this as a, a scientific paper. And then we had the Abbott that was done, um, and it was published last year too in the DHM. So again, we're moving through all these various types of blood glucose monitors. And most recently was the this transport ventilator that they wanted to use. It's a high-frequency percussive ventilator, um, and it works. It works under hyperbaric conditions, and at the end of the assessment, it was um, certainly safe for use, and that was published in the, in the UHM earlier this year. So we're progressing, and the appetite is returned because of being able to prove through the risk assessment that it's working, it does what it needs to do, and it's safe for use. Sometimes minor modifications are needed. And then just to wrap up, this is the, the one of the committees I serve on, um, the UHMS Safety Committee, and we get, they're called MedFacts. Uh, I won't say they frequently ask questions. <laughs> they are asked, you know, every now and again, but we give them answers. And this is a small subset of the 21 that we've done this year. There are a couple that are currently active on, on the go. But you can see even from colostomy bags, you know, is this thing safe for use? And then we will go through the process, give them cautions, conditions, advisories that they need to um, consider because ultimately it goes back to that medical facility for them to make that decision and it works for them. And we've been through a couple of really interesting things this year. Last year was the blood glucose monitors that kind of hit the, hit the scene. And let me finish off with where does that leave us in South Africa? And what happens is you come to Suruma, in other words, you come to me. <laughs> and I go through the process and give you as much guidance as I can. But ultimately, as I always say, the final decision is yours to take to use that mattress, to use that solution, to use that bedding, that clothing. Um, and I've had this year five alone that I've been sharing with you and giving you the information that um, hopefully will help you have confidence to be able to use it. So that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, and I, uh, This morning for me, sorry. It's only coming up 25 minutes past nine. So would you like to ask me any questions? I know um, I know this is technical and and. I know that sometimes you medical folks don't want to get involved in this, but I hope I've presented it in such a way that you realize you have the key role. And it's processes like these that allow you to play a role in this decision, knowing what it's all about. Sure, you might need some technical input, but that's easy to get. It's ultimately your decision because you're going to be exposing those patients, those tenders, the public around the chamber to the risk. So anybody have any questions for me? Don't be shy. You know that I'm not that fierce. First of all, Francois, thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. Very informative and uh, very nice approach, I'm sure, for everyone involved in the hyperbaric medical field and uh, having chambers or setting up chambers. Um, so the floor is open to any questions, any technical, any questions you have. 
any comments? Any, any comments, comments any inputs, <laughs> anything that you've tried or used or um, and that you've found to work or not work <laughs> in the chambers? Please feel free to um, to share it and to give your input or ask your questions. I've either stunned them or I've asked answer to their questions. Right, Cecilia? Yeah, it looks like you've covered everything, Francois. <laughs> or they've all went back to the drawing board, but I'm sure it's just that you covered everything. Okay, so Francois is available um, for, to us or for any questions, um, any technical issues, anything you can email him um, or send an email to, to Karen at info at Sahuma and we, we will share it with Francois and he'll get back to you. It's very good at getting back to you um, ASAP. So, um, yeah, unless there's any further questions, comments, inputs that anyone wants to give, we will break for tea.